any one of us who spend time outdoors and actually become really present to being in a natural environment, whether that's spending time at the beach or maybe be lucky enough to be in a forest, we know that there's no experience that parallels just being in nature. And so I thought to myself, well, if we're trying, if we're making a movie that's about loving nature and allowing ourselves to fall in love with nature, and yet this is an experience that we're showing indoors where everybody's sitting, it's like, how are we going to do that? And to me, that was the biggest challenge. But at the same time, there was an excitement to it that it's almost like it was an excuse to try to make it as beautiful as we could possibly make it within the budget restraints that we had and just go all out. And so obviously we did end up having um, quite a bit of time in post-production, making sure that whenever we move, would move from one scene to the next, you know, those of you who do some camera work are familiar with filming, you know that with cameras, Cameras don't adjust to lighting the same way our eyes do, right? Cameras, depending on the time of day that you're filming, if it's early morning, there's a more orangey tone to the picture. If it's midday, it's bluish. And so in order for us to make the continuity in the film, in post-production, we actually adjusted that so that it looked like when we're going from one scene to the next to the next, we're actually at the very same time of day. And so we did a few tricks like that, and of course, just trying to make the film as beautiful as possible, like I said, within the constraints we had, but also making folks realize, you know, it's like this is still a movie experience and there's nothing like actually going outdoors and experiencing for yourselves where all your senses come alive, everything, right? The feeling of the wind in our skin or the scent if we happen to be in a forest it's like that moist soil scent that is you know unequivocal and and it's like you hear the birds from all these different directions and it, here it's like wow we have surround sound but it's still six speakers it's like when we go outdoors there's a universe of speakers it's like everywhere the sounds are coming from all directions so there's no way to compare but if anything, folks who have no experience with the outdoors, they go like, wow, this is enticing. And maybe they might be encouraged to actually spend time outdoors. And the interesting thing is that, you know, even though the film is about nature, we did do quite a bit of animation, right? The Earth in a Year animation, I mean, there was no way to do this unless we were to do an animation with a ruler. I mean, there were many versions to that. But with the quotes, I had this idea, well, let's do an animation where the, the, the leaves are just kind of like, they're growing on screen, and, um, but our attempts just didn't work out. And the one thing that is really important to do for those of us who are doing any kind of creative project, I mean, it could be a book, it could be a movie, it could be a poem, whatever it might be, before publishing it or getting it out is to make sure to get feedback. And I learned this the hard way because my first couple of films, I did not get feedback. And guess what? My feedback was from the audience and they didn't like it very much. <laughs> so with this film, I actually had four focus groups. And I said, give it to me. You know, I won't take it personally. Yes, I will. But I'm going to try not to take it personally. But just tell me what's not working and what is working. What do we need more of and what do we need less of? And one of the, one of the feedbacks were get rid of your quotes, I mean, you know, the, the animation for the quotes. And I was like, well, maybe it's supposed to be nature. So when she and I went to Northern California, I took the camera with me and I said, you know, I mean, we were going to go to Muir Woods anyway. And I said, this is the place. It was sundown. The sun had already gone down. It was getting dark. And I'm like, well, the quotes, of course, are white. It's text. Let's just film here. And so we found four, five, six different locations. And I just let the camera roll for maybe a couple of minutes every time. But in post-production, with the mixing, with, a, with the audio mixer, we actually we cheated. And we ended up coming up with a bunch of different sounds. So the first quotes have critters. And the second quotes has frogs. And you know, the third quote, the last quote is actually my favorite sound, which is the sound, did, I wanted to know whether anybody has noticed this, but the final quote from Rachel Carson has, their sounds of wolves communicating across the distance. Isn't that beautiful? 
it's like you have the crying wolf and then the other one in the distance responding, which is usually how they communicate at a distance. And, um, you know, so ultimately, yeah, I had to listen. And that was just one of the feedbacks. It was a more traditional documentary with like a third person narration and all of that, the voice of God or the intelligence or whatever. So I ended up realizing that we did have a storytelling challenge. I ended up hiring a Fernanda Rossi. She calls herself DocuDoctor. She's somebody who can take your script and massage it. And um, the interesting thing was that the idea that she came up with was instead of having a third person narration, how about if you have a character, a first person, an I story, somebody's telling their story. And I've had friends who tell, who tell me like, why don't you tell your story? Here you are, you grew up in Brazil and you're a nature lover and you know, it's like you speak all these languages and I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not about me. We need to find a character that it's about everybody. And then I said to Fernanda, I'm like, how about if Homo sapiens is talking to us? She's like, sure. And then I realized what I told her. I'm like, but wait a second. I've spent years writing script after script after script. You're telling me I'm going to have to trash everything and start from scratch? I was pretty freaked out. And she says, no, don't worry. The work that I do is like this. Imagine that your air conditioner is not working. What I'm going to do is, instead of having you buy a new air conditioner, I'm going to tell you that one boat that you need to change, and everything else is going to fall into place. So it was really a leap of faith. And I, I trusted her. And I said, OK, let's try to get the script. And let's you know, do it as Sapiens is telling his, her story. Um, and you know, it, was, it ended up being just like maybe two or three days worth of work together, which was mind-blowing, because after years of writing script after script, that really, it came together. And so, anyway, so that was another thing, another feedback. And just briefly, a third feedback I got was about the biological revolution and biomimicry, where some um, ecologists and folks from the environmental movement were saying, um, you know, this move, this, this, science or this revolution is not here yet. And the way you're presenting you know, the film sounds like we're already in it, that our civilization is already diving into this new era of human evolution. When in reality, it's, we're not quite there yet. It's actually a very budding movement. And we ended up inserting, I don't know if you recall that, but we actually have seedlings cracking through the ground and sapiens saying something to the effect of, um, you know, biomimicry is still far from being an everyday reality, but I'm starting to realize the potential of a new technological era inspired by nature. And so that little bit didn't exist before, and it was getting some of my colleagues kind of pissed off that it's like, no, we're not there yet. We need to demonstrate that it's just budding. So that's okay. okay. And that's the beauty of documentary filmmaking, is that you can actually start a process and then fundraise and then get some money and then continue filming and then fundraise again. So we had several phases of fundraising. And one of the reasons why it took so long was because when I just started fundraising in basically 2008 is when the economy cr came crashing down. So I had to put the film in the back burner until you know everybody was so concerned about their portfolios that donations for films were very difficult. So it was definitely an idea first. I mean, I certainly had, and like Sheila said, right? It's like if you're making the film that you had in your mind at the very beginning, then you weren't listening. Um, of course, my idea at the beginning, even though the heart of the idea was there, that it was about a film that had to do with the, the ultimate intimacy of our connection with nature. I didn't exactly know what path I was going to take. But I started basically filming, creating a first trailer, and then you know, using that as a fundraising tool, and then continuing filming, replacing a lot of the footage that I might have used on the first trailer, create a new trailer, and then it was basically a process. And it's a process that is time consuming. It can be very difficult, so you wanna bring people on your team that have experience or knowledge that are business people who might have a sense, a commercial sense of how to make things 
uh, appealing to investors, whether you want to go the route of investing or whether you want to go the route of donations. We ended up doing two fundraising events, one in Los Angeles, another one in Miami. And we did a Kickstarter campaign for finishing funds on the film. And to be honest with you, I put my own money at the very beginning and at the very end. I bookended it because I couldn't get anything started. How would anybody want to give us money if they don't even know what the film, what, you know, what, what the film looked like? The beauty of 2017 is that nowadays you can get a 4K camera very inexpensively. You can edit from your laptop, from your computer. And ideally, and that's what I was telling you before when we were having that conversation, it's, it takes a village to make a movie. And our credit roll is six minutes long. And the single most important thing that you can ever do is to connect with people who are professionals in the field, connect with organizations that have a very strong interest in that one particular subject that you're approaching, connecting with government organizations, and it's basically a collaborative effort. You can't do this alone. I just came back from Vancouver. There was a conference called the Children and Nature Network, and it was put together by, by this organization that was founded by Richard Louvre. I'm just curious to know, who knows Richard Louvre and the last child in the woods? Okay, uh, just a couple of you. Well, basically, he's been very strong in the movement of introducing children to nature, because they're... There are many studies nowadays that are showing that whenever children do not have an experience of nature, it affects them in terms of their physical health, in terms of their mental, and even neurological development. And what, the reason why I'm bringing up this conference is because Richard said in his presentation, just 15 years ago when they started doing you know, the conferences and more of this work, there are only 30 studies that actually demonstrated or had data about how nature impacts us physically and how it impacts our brain. Well, the exciting thing is that nowadays there are 500 studies. And the interesting thing is that many of us have known intuitively, even like when we look at all the wisdom traditions and the spiritual traditions of the world, the Eastern traditions from Buddhism to Hinduism, but also, of course, indigenous traditions all over the world. Basically, what they have in common is the sense that we are interconnected with this bigger picture, that we're just part of this bigger world. But our rational and scientific minds, right, and I include everybody, all of us, we want to have evidence of what we have known intuitively. So the exciting thing about our times is that all these studies are coming out that are actually showing us hard data that actually things like our pulse rate, things are about that have to do with stress reduction, things that have to do with, again, childhood brain development, they're actually showing that the experience of nature is something that we need for health in every way. So this particular study that um, you're pointing to, Sheila, was actually put together by Greg Bretman from Stanford University. And what he did is that he took 90 participants, he sent them to the woods. Okay, you guys go for a 90 minute walk in the woods. And then he took another 90 participants and to say, okay, you go to the city and just walk in the city you know, where there's traffic and there are buildings and it's just, you know, so a group in the city and a group in nature. And then not only did they do questionnaires afterwards, but they also studied their brains by doing scans of their brains afterwards. And they've discovered there's a part of our brain that's called the subjunial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. And that part of our brain is activated when we're in this place of rumination you know when we're in that place of like negative thinking? It's like my life is worth nothing and everything is wrong and I hate my world, I hate my family, whatever it might be. Those negative thoughts that are coming back over and over again, which they actually call it rumination, um, is basically that part of the brain is more activated when you're ruminating. So what they found is that the folks that were walking 90 minutes in the city 
had their subgenual prefrontal cortex totally activated, and the folks who were in nature actually had it pretty dormant. <laughs> so they were more zen, if you could say that. They were feeling more relaxed. They were feeling more positive about their lives and the world around them. And so what that study actually indicates, because this sense of rumination is um, a predicative, if you can say that word, for depression, that was one of the first studies that actually shows a direct link between depression and la lack of nature. So ultimately, spending time in nature is one way, you could call it your antidepressant in a way, <laughs> because it relaxes that part of the brain that is into rumination and negative thinking. That's great. It's free, and you don't have to get a, it's pre free. a prescription. No drugs necessary. And, and, no and alcohol. And, it's just being outdoors.